flying solo tonight. Um, Stuart is otherwise engaged with a different project. Hopefully he'll join us halfway through. Um, but this was, uh, this is always, as you know, a topic that's very close to my heart and um, just want to welcome uh, our special guest tonight, James Nottingham, uh, who Thank most you. of you know that I've been talking about for quite a while. So thanks for joining us, James. Much appreciated. Nice to be with you. Um, yeah, so um, we had uh, had a, a, a chat with uh, Martin Toms uh, back in November and Gordon McClellan. I don't know if anybody caught that, but you can re-watch that in the archives. Um, certainly well worth um, talking about uh, tonight's topic, which is, you know, for me, it's about how we change the, the way that we teach our uh, foundational year age groups, really, um, based on much research um, over the past few months, talking to James a lot, talking to everybody else, witnessing coaching around the world. I just felt that um, we're not quite addressing the fallout or the dropout rate when kids get to you know, 13, 14 years old. And I think we need to do a better job of engaging uh, the children. So that's kind of where we're going to go tonight. Um, the conversation we had back in November actually was about um, how we could become much more efficient as golf coaches. And to James's credit, because he knows what he's talking about, um, he challenged me back to the fact that that's probably not what we should be looking at and actually more over looking at how we create more efficient learners and that for me is 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 something that makes far more sense because an efficient learner is is a learner that's going to progress a bit quicker and um, more than likely um, feel more successful and probably be far more engaged uh, in the sport for a longer period of time which is our ultimate goal so that's kind of um, one of the outcomes for me tonight. Um, and then understanding really what engagement is, I think um, unless we can define that, then it's very difficult to put some plans in place to change that and to improve it. So um, I think you're aware the status quo with where we're at right now is that um, kids are generally um, fine up to the end of primary school or elementary school. Um, but as soon as they start hitting 13, 14 years old, we are seeing certainly across multiple sports um, around about a 70% dropout rate. And that goes across a multitude of different sports as well across different continents. And I've not seen it vastly different from one uh, environment really to the next. So you know, that's a kind of a headline figure. And that's been around for, I believe, around 10 years or so. And what we're doing, despite the, a belief that we're growing the game, um, actually, we might well be growing in terms of more numbers of kids coming into the game at a year, uh, an earlier age group. But actually, we're still getting that 70% dropout rate once they get to those ages. And I think there are a multitude of different reasons for that. Going into middle school or high school, is certainly one of those reasons and being distracted by other things. But I think if we have a more engaged student at that point, a, a kid that's far more um, in tune with the reasons why they play, then I think we, uh, we are able to protect their involvement in the game for a much longer period of time. And I'm always focused on making sure the kids that I teach are uh, still playing the game when they're 30, right? Because if they are, then we've done our job in terms of protecting the future of the sport. And if they get good at it, then, you know, that's a bonus and not, it shouldn't be something that we set out to do when, um, when the kids are sort of seven or eight years old. So um, I'll come to you in just a second, James. Thank you for being patient. I just wanted to set the tone really for the conversation this evening. Um, and I think that collectively over the next 
hour, whatever, uh, the next few weeks and months, I want us to find the answer to how we can engage kids for a lifetime. I think this is a discussion that will be ongoing and it will develop, but um, how do we engage, engage kids for a lifetime for me relates to then defining what that means. So James, um, before you dive into the answer to that question, can you just give us a little bit of background as to um, where you're coming from and the angle um, from which you're going to attack this and, and why I think it's important to look at golf coaching in this context differently um, than, uh, than we've been looking at up to this point. Yeah, thank you for that, Gavin, and uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon or whatever your time zone is right now. It's uh, nice to be with you all. I'm not coming from a coaching background. I'm coming from a teaching background. I failed hopelessly at school. I did fine at primary school, got to secondary and got uh, expelled three times, hated the damn place and couldn't wait to leave. And that's why I went into teaching, thinking surely I can do a better job than the Muppets who taught me. And I've been on a mis mission ever since <laughs> to find out what is it that went wrong um, and what can I do about it? And so I went into teaching as a teacher uh, for a number of years and then a, a head teacher or principal and then um, I was asked to set up a social regeneration project here in northeast England to raise aspirations and that's uh, uh, raise aspirations and achievement um, ironically these days bearing in mind what's going on it was funded by European money and um, I started working not just with the schools, but community groups, sports groups. And that's when my sort of mind expanded a bit more to outside of the classroom and thinking learning takes place everywhere. Learning takes place in the staff room. Learning takes place in the home. Learning takes place in the community groups, in the sports groups, in the coaching. And I've uh, been fascinated by it ever since. Um, I then set up a company challenging learning um, and we've now got six companies in six countries with 30 staff um, all looking at how we can primarily we support teachers um, wherever you find them whether schools colleges universities preschools but also more and more these days uh, with uh, coaches and teachers outside of shall we say traditional uh, education spaces so my focus is in thinking about what's the research telling us what can we learn from the research and how can it apply to practice and challenging a lot of the things that have been there since uh, Noah was a boy really um, a lot of educational practice was set up in the industrial era um, and it was set up at the same time as uh, doctors were using leeches for bloodletting so that that's uh, that's the that's where our education uh, that the era came from and there's a lot of things to change and i want to pick up on one of the points that you made right at the beginning there gavin that the we do as a as a group of educators and i'm using that in the broadest sense there is a lot to be gained in moving away from thinking what is it that I'm doing and much more on what is it that the young person is learning. We are very slowly starting to realize that in education. So an example would be fewer principals will watch teachers teach these days and instead they'll go into classrooms to watch students learning and see what the students are doing when they don't know what to do how willing are they to ask questions how motivated are they um, how good are they at collaborating so they're watching the learning rather than the teaching a uh, classic classic example is feedback and uh, that's um, one thing i'm desperately trying to change in education is feedback there's still this sense of feedback is what I give to my students. Whereas actually feedback ought to be thought of as what do my students receive, understand and use. And that has an important implication. For example, teachers should never stagger home with a big pile of books to mark at the end of a task. It's just 
utterly, utterly pointless and thousands and thousands of hours are wasted every single week across the world with teachers doing that because the teachers mark the work, give it back and the kids look and go, meh, and do nothing with it because it was marked at the end of the work rather than before they finished. It was seen as a summary rather than advice. The students looked at it and just looked at their scores rather than think, so what's this advice telling me? What can I learn from it? How can I use it? What impact does that have on my learning or on the product? So that's that's an example. Um, and I think it's really very important to think about that, partly because of what should we say? And I'm guessing here in your coaching world, but if parents are paying you to coach the kids, they want to see that you are busy people, that you're working damn hard to earn your pennies. And there's this idea, I mean, we have it in teaching that, we, you know, if somebody comes into my classroom, <laughs> I ain't going to sit at my desk. I'm going to jump up and scurry around and look busy because apparently I'm paid to be busy, you know, pay, paid to teach. Whereas actually what we should be thinking is, no, sometimes it's better to shut up and keep out of the way. Sometimes it's better just to give a nod and keep at it. The, the, the top is spinning well enough. And if we start to introduce something else, it might send it off and stop it from spinning. So it, it's much less about what am I doing and much more about what are the students learning right now? And that's what that, that's to add to your point earlier, Gavin, that um, I think it's massively important that we think about the coaching sessions in terms of what did the kids learn what progress did they make? What thinking did they do? What are they now going to do after this coaching session and before next coaching session? And those are the questions that I personally would be advocating rather than, did I do good? Did I explain things clearly? Was I busy? Was I showing them good techniques? Did they enjoy it? I mean, enjoying, of course, is a, an important part of it, but it, it's much more about going to what have they received, understood and used rather than what have I given. That's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? And I think um, you touched on uh, the topic of testing and marking work that I've had conversations with, with many of you that are listening tonight um, and how we use the information that we get from testing. Um, and I, you know, from what I said to you before, James, that I'm, I'm much more at peace with the idea of testing children on a regular basis, as long as we do the two things that we're supposed to do with that information. One is to react to, um, to the test in terms of what to teach in the future, but also then to measure the progress that the kids have made. And then of course, to communicate those results to the parents because they're paying the bills. So I think it's really important that we understand the context of that. But also, I think as we're listening to this, you'll make many references that many may feel will be um, representative of what goes on in a classroom. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, James, but I definitely feel that a classroom is an equal environment to, you know, a, a teaching bay. They, it's a still a, a learning space, effectively, and, and kids are still kids. And... Um, I don't think that the, uh, the concepts will, will differ vastly, if, if at all. Um, and then the other point I wanted to make, actually, which is a question based on what you've just said, James, which is actually, we're talking about kids being a student here, but would you see much of a difference if we were talking about our students being adults in terms of how we're supposed to deal with them? No, I, I wouldn't see very much of difference at all, apart from the obvious ones in terms of the language you might use or the, the explanations you might give or the, the breaks that you might need to give them or not, as the case may be. But um, uh, I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you about the classroom space and the, the, the coaching bay and learning in general, I, I wanted to paint a picture of my background so that uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of saying, listen, I'm not a coach, so uh, you're the experts in coaching. Yeah. 
uh, my expertise is in pedagogy, in, in understanding research and how that applies to learning and wherever learning takes place. And to be honest, I spend 80 something percent of my, my professional life these days teaching adults, not teaching kids. I'm teaching adults to teach kids. Um, and of course, with my employees in lots of different cultures as well, the mm. pedagogy, the practices, the theory applies just as much to them as it does to the kids in the coaching bay or in the classroom. So absolutely, it, it, it's, it's pedagogy, it's, it's learning. It's how do we help people to learn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, I, I don't know if anybody else is, is even diving into uh, this whole process, um, but I think we are onto something groundbreaking. I think that when you dive a little bit deeper into it, when we, we open this up and we, we start talking about it more, I think you will start to see the light and to see that it absolutely makes sense. We've got to stop being teachers. And I think I, I've nearly finished this article I'm writing, which basically is entitled, I don't know if I'll go with this title or not, but it's, um, it's the one that says, uh, if we want to protect the future of our sport, we've got to stop teaching our children. And I think that um, you'll look at that and go, oh, well, what's he talking about? What a Muppet type thing. But you know, when you dive a little bit deeper into it and understand the context of it, it's like, well, absolutely. You know, we've got to empower the kids to take responsibility for what they learn. We've got to set it up so that their environment when they come into that is free for them to explore and experiment, try things out. You know, there are no repercussions for failure or doing things wrong. You know, they can laugh, they can cry, they can do whatever they want basically as they embark on this journey of picking up a new skill. But we have to present the opportunity for that whole process to happen so i mean we'll dive into that in a little bit more detail in a minute i wanted just to get your answer james please on what you felt um an engaged kid looks like or what engagement actually means yeah um just jotting down a couple of notes i want to pick up on that point about mistakes in a moment if i may gavin but um that that question you've asked about what engaged learner looks like of course that's so different. Uh, it, it's, we're talking social science here. Education is a social science. That means that what we, we can do the same thing twice with two different groups and have totally different outcomes because we're, we're dealing with people and not widgets. You know, this is a social science is this, we can look at research, we can look at best practice, and the best that we can say is this will probably work for the right person at the right time in the right context. And that's all we can say. We can use the research as a form guide. We can't say for sure this is what will happen. So we've got to caveat that very strongly, I think. Um, and dealing with different cultures, some cultures, of course, eye contact some no eye contact some would be uh, encouraged and expected to ask questions others would be expected to be quiet and to consume it all and then maybe ask questions later some would be encouraged to challenge and others wouldn't so it's really difficult to say what we mean by motivated but i think there's an there's an something maybe worth hanging um uh, a peg on and that is um the lovely story of the Pygmalion and Pygmalion effect. So Pygmalion, of course, is a part of Greek mythology and there's Pygmalion was a sculptor and he made this stunning statue, absolutely beautiful. In fact, so beautiful that he fell in love with this statue and the gods brought the statue alive and that statue was called Galatea. And in education, we use those two terms, Pygmalion and Galatea. The Pygmalion effect, is what I think, what I believe my students will be capable of, often becomes reality. Galatea is what students think of themselves and what they think is possible, often becomes reality. 
So the ultimate, of course, in any coaching or teaching situation is to have both the Pygmalion and the Galatea effect in operation at the same time. I believe in my students and my students believe in themselves. I believe my students are going to improve their game, are going to be very skilled at this technique or at this particular strategy. I believe it. I talk to them as if that's the case. Everything I say, everything I do, every micro movement gives them the sense that I totally expect them to be able to do it. That's the Pygmalion. Galatea is them thinking, I've got this. I can figure this out. I'm going to be able to do it. I can't wave a magic wand. I can't do it like that, but I will be able to do it. And I believe in myself and put those two together and world watch out. In terms of outcomes, actually Galatea is stronger than Pygmalion. The best is having both. But if you're talking, Gavin, about what does a motivated learner look like? Well, we've all met them. We've all met those learners who are utterly and completely driven, and it's an intrinsic drive. It's not the parents pushing them to do it. It's not them doing it because it's on their schedule for the week to do. It's not because they've been dragged along by someone else. It's, that's their passion. That's their goal. That's their belief. That's their desire. And to be honest, it's an utter joy to work with those those learners. I was about to say those kids, but let's call them learners because you might be thinking adults. And we are there to encourage them on their journey. The challenge for us is what happens when you've got kids who don't have that, who haven't got even an ounce of that self-efficacy, that Galatea effect in them, that they are purely and simply going through the motions, that they're there because somebody else has determined that they should be there. And then that, that becomes a question for us all. Is that something that, we should be trying to change. And of course, if it is, then uh, the Pygmalion effect has a, a, a big impact in that. So I don't know if that helps or not, uh, Gavin, but it, it's, I suppose that's an extraordinary long-winded way of saying, I don't know what a motivated learner looks like because they all look so bloody different. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think when we're talking about creating um, the right environment where I guess we enable learning to, I guess, flourish, um, you know, you, you set the environment up and different kids will react to that environment in different ways, won't they? And I think that's okay. Um, th there's got to be progression and different levels of interaction that you help create um, with that environment in the beginning. But, you know, you can effectively set the same challenge up for the same group of kids, have different levels of progression that would engage kids at different levels. But of course, I think this nicely goes into really the, 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 the heart of, of what I wanted to talk about tonight um, and changing how we have traditionally delivered golf instruction, which is to stand at the front of the class and spurt out the technical information that we've got or that we think will be useful, that we think one, two, three bits might actually stick with the potential listening child to um, actually creating what we're referring to now as this experiential environment where you set up the challenge, the task or the obstacle for the kids to overcome. And you then, as you said a few minutes ago, James, you stand back and observe, you scan, you watch the kids go through this process. And um, we, we want to, to encourage the poster, the learning pit behind me, you want to encourage that to evolve you want to make sure that the kids are challenged and, and conflicted. Um, you want them to experience the different emotions, all in pursuit of what I like to refer to as getting them into the sweet spot of learning. So if you don't create that experience, then they'll never get to the point where they're the ones that are going to ask you questions. And I've always felt now for the last year, year and a bit, really, where um, 
if the kid's asking you a, a question, they want to know the answer. It's quite specific to that individual child. So we end up creating a very child-centric environment where we are focused on the individual, despite the fact that the, the, the kid might be part of a bigger group, but all because we've created a challenge and we've asked the kid to go and solve it and we've let them try it out and we've let them fail. So I think you want to come on to that point of failure, James, and talk about that. But um, in your experience, I would guess that we're kind of on the right track with that whole process, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, one of the things that um, I, I find interesting, I was doing a presentation the other day for some uh, Finnish and Swedish teachers, and uh, it was about feedback. And I thought I'd, what I'd do is get some um, images. And I, uh, I went online, put in a search for feedback, and almost all of the um, images that were coming up were kids either celebrating or commiserating. They were showing that they had been successful or they're showing that they failed. And that's what Google deemed to be feedback. So I changed the term to coaching and then I got the images that I wanted, that I see as feedback and that is advice. That is helping them to understand what it is that they're doing and to identify the next thing that they're going to do, the adjustment that they're going to make. So I th that gives me a lot of, what shall we say, optimism for your profession in terms of uh, there's a lot of mental models that your profession is based upon that gives you an advantage over shall we say, traditional teaching. Um, but the, the, uh, the, you said the, about sweet spot there, and I know it was, it, it was a, a term that you used as part of your question, but as I was listening to you, I was thinking to myself, one of the issues I think you might have in this is what is it that the learner is focusing on and is that the same thing as you're focusing on? I would anticipate that certainly if we're talking the, the, the junior coaching that uh, you were talking about before this meeting, Gavin, I would suggest, I would guess that most kids are thinking, how far did I hit the ball? That's what they're focused on. Did I hit the ball hard? Did I get it a long way? Whereas I, perhaps what you're thinking is, did they hit the sweet spot? You're thinking more technique. You're thinking, see my, my kids, my three kids, um, they, they're swimmers and it's quite easy for them in many ways to separate out technique from performance. And we've drilled it into them right from a very early age. It's all about technique focus on technique and speed will come later get the technique right now I mean some my eldest actually is a bit like driving Miss Daisy she just thinks she never has to go fast just so long as she looks beautiful in the water she'll be fine but it, it's easy enough to separate in in swimming between performance and technique my question I suppose back to all of you is is it as easy to do so in golfing coaching because are they thinking yeah but if I if the ball went a long way I'm happy irrespective of whether that was a fluke shot irrespective of whether it was good technique bad technique and I'm thinking if you have got them focusing on the right thing whatever the right thing is that's going to make your life and their life much 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 easier in terms of progress in terms of coaching in terms of advice but if they're looking at something different, if they're just wanting to lift their head up very quickly to see how far did I hit it? And whereas you were looking at the backswing or you were looking at their feet position or you were looking at their head position or you were thinking about the sweet spot and so on, then the advice you're giving is actually probably going to miss the mark. And they might see it as a mistake. They might see it as failure. They might see it as success. And it, it, there's a whole lot of things going on here that 
I think that's my question back to all of you is what does that feel like? What does that look like in golf coaching? I think that's a great opportunity for anybody to feed back on that. <laughs> uh, if you want to, if you feel like you've got an answer to that, then um, just uh, unmute yourself and, and crack on. Um, I think my initial response to that is um, it's process versus outcome, isn't it? And it depends on what we um, what we want to do. So uh, we'll go Leah and then Warren. What do you think then? So with that, I would I think most of you will agree with this. When you've got kids, they literally all they want to do is hit it as far as they can. They don't care if they hit it absolutely sideways. It's just literally they don't even care if it's rolled a hundred yards as long as it's gone further than someone else. But what happens is the parent comes along and says, "Well, their swing looks awful, or that doesn't look right." But you. I, I don't care how it looks. If they're like buzzing and it's gone really far, that's great. The kid's really happy, but then the parent comes along and crushes that, you know, success to them because it doesn't look right. I find that's the hardest thing to deal with when you're coaching juniors. I don't find the juniors hard. I find managing the parents hard and then what they're going to say to that kid when they go off to the range together when you're not stood there. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Uh, <laughs> it happens like all the time. Yeah, yeah, you have to manage that. And that takes time to fix, time to implement. And that's why, you know, um, we've got our engaging parent course as part of the certification now. It's there for a reason because it's so important. But it's a process. And I think you will agree, Lee, you're, you're not going to uh, solve that jigsaw puzzle in uh in three or four weeks it's a long-term process um warren what um what was your point well um I, i've heard this from a few people it's a bit like saying oh um uh, there's a few there's a few little things to this so I'll, I'll start with this first but the first thing is about um let hit the ball as far as you can and then we'll talk this and then we'll sort the technique out later so a bit of the opposite to what was just said by james so it's like, you know, let's get you hitting the ball as far and then we'll, we'll work on the technique. And for me, it's kind of what is the right process, it, you know, and I think is it important to understand the individual? Um, but just to use this as a story, um, I was playing in the Kenyan Open in 2004 and it's, a, it's about five and a half thousand feet above sea level. And I was hitting the ball for miles <laughs> but then i played with this south african and just hit this ball just ridiculous distances and uh, he, he basically said it's all about how how they genetically do stuff in south africa it was quite interesting <laughs> he said it's all in the breeding he said <laughs> so so but i think i think for me i think everyone's got different attributes um as individuals and and you go to different parts of the world um and i watched this program it was really interesting about athletics um and colin jackson and it was about why is it certain athletes from certain parts of the world are very good at say the the medium long distance running and some places are you know um you know, uh, you know, just using certain parts of the well where they run very, very quickly. And the thing with golf is, you know, you know, you look at people like um, Ernie Els, and you look at somebody like Nick Price, who's right. And obviously, they both both work with David. So who's right? Is it Big Easy? Is it Nick Price? And that's the, and there's and so for me, it's kind of like what who are you dealing with and 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 what can you find out about them do you do tests like get them running as an example to find out uh, how they do things in rhythm there's a test i can do with children where you get them to close their eyes and get them to walk out and they're not worried about anyone else but they're kind of like can, you know they're in their own kind of pace so lots of different things it's, it's, it's been into i just thought i'd just throw that all out there I think that's a topic uh, that we could talk about. I think it's slightly away from the direction I wanted to go down, Warren, but I think that's a fascinating topic because you're talking more about genetics um, and you're talking more about, 
you know, the, the, the nurturing process as opposed to the nature conversation. Um, but Captain, can, you know, sorry, I think can, I just, down can I jump in there, pick up on something that Leia said, though, that, that that's made me think, you know, it's a two part question. What does progress look like? And who decides it? Because if you're speaking one language, and I don't mean you know, French or whatever, German, English, I'm talking, if, if, if you are thinking progress looks like this, and then the child is thinking actually progress looks like that, and then their parents are thinking progress looks like something else, how in the hell do you ever get any sense of progress and any agreement about progress and any sense of what am I going to do next with them? No. Because if so, it is so about hitting I, it hard, I, you know? I can relate to this massively. So I'm dyslexic. So I've learned very early on. The way I learn is very different <laughs> to everybody mm. else. Yeah. And I've been exposed mm. to failure quite early on at school. Interesting, you said right at the start about how the, obviously the education system is from the Victorian era, Industrial Revolution, it was to fit in with an ideal. Um, yeah. I have a little video uh, podcast with another pro who's to sex, and we talk about this a lot and how education system is, is pretty flawed, really. It only suits a certain type of person, and um, it's a lot of people are expected to fit inside that box. So when you hear say that word uh, progress what we're expected to do as students is to sit GCSEs get a certain grade if you don't get this grade then you can't get this job you can't go to university I knew very early on that was always going to be very difficult for me and how I viewed progress was very different to how my parents viewed it and how teachers viewed it so my mum's a teacher as well <laughs> unpack that um but to me, going through school, I knew I might not be able to get certain grades, but it wasn't about that. It was about just trying to come away from it, understanding the subject a little bit better, and have I done everything possible to achieve the best grade possible. If I, if I didn't get it, I didn't get it. But if I'd done everything I could, then for me, that was progress. And I think that's how I deal with my lessons as well with the kids it makes no difference to me whether I get anybody in my group who could be an amazing golfer or they are not very good at golf but they just continue playing so I get, I guess in my sessions I get the kids to almost set their own goals on how they want to progress at times I ask them what do they want to get out of it what do, are they expecting to do later on in the year and then we work with that so I've got some who clearly want to try and be good at it get into some of my count my sorry sessions and in others it's like oh, i just like turning up on a saturday because my mate's here because george is here that's fine by me but we'll find a way of managing and accommodating for for all of it um i don't know if that's kind of what you're asking <laughs> I answer that. um but yeah that's, that's so what i try and consciously do is not put the kids into a box or just teach the same way all the time if I if I can see there's a kid who's got maybe a um, learning difficulty um, is try and find a way of to relate to them and how I can incorporate that into the lesson so they don't miss out as well that's what's really tricky in a group setting is you've obviously got a whole bunch of personalities a whole bunch of different ways of learning it's how do you marry it all together I don't know if you've got any advice with that well, yes, certainly have advice, but um, yeah, uh, I, I'm just looking at time and looking with people with their hands up and so on, but uh, their their virtual hands up. Um, I, I, <laughs> I think it, it comes down to that. Unless you're clear, and I'm not saying you're not clear here, Lee, I'm just as, asking it's a broad question. Unless you are clear about what progress looks like, and what it's, I was going to say measured against, but I don't want to, to for you to assume that means like so reducing the handicap or B 
being able to measure it in terms of distance hit and so on. I mean, measure in the broadest sense, compare, let's say, unless you have an idea of where you want them to be and how close you are helping them to get to that point, then I don't know how on earth we would know if we are making progress or not, aside from kids saying, yeah, I enjoyed that. That was good. Or the parents saying, yeah, that was all right. I'll pay you to teach them again. Uh, is it about them going on and winning a competition? Is it about them reducing their handicap? Is it about them continuing beyond what's the, beyond the junior age range, uh, Gavin, so that you're not getting the dropout rate? Is it that out of 100 kids, you get one that goes on to have a career in golf? Is it um, that you start with 50 and end up with 100 kids? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just top of the head stuff here. But unless you know what you mean by progress, you're not going to be able to get any sense of clarity or agreement, A, with the learners or B, with their parents. And without that clarity, you're not going to be able to determine whether you are making progress or not. Excellent. Darren, have you uh, got something to add to that? Uh, yep. Yeah, again, progress. Uh, I guess it's more with the little ones, but progress for kids is all about enjoyment. And when the parent, not not every time, but when some parents come and get the user, are they improving in that? A quick, easy answer is, do they want to come in the, in the morning? Are they ready to come in the morning or are they having to drag them here? Because if they're enjoying themselves, they're improving, they're making they're making progress. So what do we do with the want... kids that don't enjoy it? So, but can I just uh, push back on that a little bit, Darren? And uh, so yeah. if, if the measure, and again, I'm using that in the broadest sense, if the measure is enjoyment, then it's less about progress and more about, yes, they did or no, they didn't. Yeah, th th this is in the group sessions, you know, progress is one-to-one -to, -one to me. You know, as in ability, really getting a handicap down, they wouldn't be in a group session. So in group sessions, mm. you don't have um, any criteria except that. And this is oh, no, uh, I, I don't, have this is a value saying... judgment. This is a clarification question. Are you saying yeah. the main point of the group session is they enjoy it? No, no, I'm not. I'm just saying that, you know, for, for when you get parents just to get them to think about whether it's what the child wants or what they want you can just use the enjoyment aspect of it just to make them to think out of the box is it their expectations or is it the kids expectations that's what that's all right. i'm trying to suggest so 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 a child going for you to ascertain whether it was a good use of time, a successful session. The criterion is the kids enjoyed themselves. It would be, uh, one, of, one of them is, yeah. Could, and then likewise, other... with, with, the challenge, with, with the challenge of the set, seeing them improve, you know, there's lots of different ones, but, but one you can use when the parents come to you to ask is yeah. you know are you dragging them here or do they want to come you know it's, it makes them the stand line. back and think i think that's a product that's the product of uh, a kid that's engaged in what's going on that's um the, the product of uh, the activities that you've created and i also think that we also we have to understand how kids derive their enjoyment from the activity of playing golf. Um, uh, an engaged kid for me looks like, it could be described in many different ways, but they've got to feel like they're improving. They've got to feel like they're getting better. And we can't just give a subjective response as to what we think in terms of them getting better. I'm, per I'm wholly convinced that we have to measure that. 
And we had to measure that with a, a series of standard skills challenges that the kids would do on a regular basis so that we could track their progress and look at it in terms of numbers and get a general picture of their upward trend. But also then we can, uh, we can tailor what we're coaching based on the results of these challenges that the kids go through. And if you're doing it the same thing every time where um, you're, you're, you're measuring the <clears throat> putting, short game, you're chipping, pitching, irons, woods, um, you'll have a, an equal kind of measurement when the kids get onto the golf course in terms of score. And you'll get an overall picture then as to the general progress of the kids. But unless you do something like that, then your interpretation of how they're improving um, is going to be fairly subjective. And you're going to end up with kids that don't necessarily enjoy it or you won't have answers to solve the reasons why kids aren't enjoying it. Um, and, and as I said a minute ago, I think a kid that's improving is a kid that's more likely to gain far more enjoyment from it. And let's not forget that when the kids do get into their teenage years, their enjoyment comes from improved performance, how well they did in the tournament, you know, how far they're hitting it. It's far more based around skill. And that's how they get their, their fun element of it. And, and even then, it might not seem like fun um, to anybody outside of that uh, I that child. So I, I just the, think it's um, it. Yeah, so, I mean, I agree. I agree. The the point about fun, of course, we want the kids to be having fun, and if they're not if they're not having fun, then it's going to be much more difficult to motivate them anyway. Um, if we look at the research in terms of motivation, the biggest influence on motivation is success by far and away the biggest biggest motivating factor the more i succeed the more likely i am to be motivated and of course it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because the more motivated i am the more likely i am to succeed so how do we help them to be successful and that's what i'm coming back to really and that's why i was pushing you a little bit there darren because i was just trying to work out but successful in what successful if i take layers point successful in hitting the ball a long way or successful in winning a competition or successful at being enjoying their day or successful at making a friend when they're there or successful at turning up every single coaching session if we don't yeah, know take, the take criteria that we're measuring against then it's very difficult to say whether we've been successful or not maybe that's not a problem but the second part to that research is as well as success being the most motivating factor there is also a link to challenge and that means the more challenge they succeed with the bigger the impact on their motivation so if they succeed with something easy or we make something that is challenging very easy for them they succeed they're more likely to succeed but actually that is less likely to lead to further motivation and it's about getting uh, to use your term uh Gavin, the sweet spot there the sweet spot is challenge but also scaffolding or support or coaching or whatever it is that we're going to help with here so those are the things that buzzing around in my mind is okay so if we want motivated you want motivated students you want motivated learners so that they keep going so they fall in love with this sport and they keep going till their dying days you want them to fall in love with it so that means you need motivated people motivated learners the best way to motivate people is to help them to be successful however the more that success comes with challenging things for them the more there is an increase in motivation the easier the success the less the effect on motivation so it's how are you going to get that balance right challenge them too much 
they don't succeed and therefore that has a negative effect on motivation. Don't challenge them enough and they do succeed, but it doesn't help their motivation. That's why it's so bloody difficult, this teaching and learning malarkey, because to get that sweet spot for every flipping kid that you're teaching, it's just like... It's, it's a challenge, that's for sure, for us as coaches, right? Um, and that's why I think it's going to evolve over a period of time. You know, I don't think that we can necessarily implement a, uh, a solution this time next week. We've got to, we've got to find different ways to create that environment for the kids uh, that, that's appropriate to each individual child, even if they're in a group or not. Um, I just want to go over to Ben. Hi, mate. I think you've got uh, a couple of points you want to refer to. Um, based on what we've just been talking about. Hiya, how are we doing? So I just wanted to kind of bring up a point and I was actually just in the middle of typing something here and this kind of brings up some very Tony Robbins-esque stuff that I used to listen to, especially as a child. I listened to a lot of the motivation and the happiness and the stuff from, from the age of 11. So I, I, I'll ask the question and I'll kind of follow up with kind of what I was just about to type anyway, before you ask me to, to kind of bring in that question there, Gavin. Um, th my question was really kind of based on, on children on actually wanting to be there. So how do we actually find out if the child really wants to be there? Because children can improve even though they don't want to be there. Because if we were in school, Yes, we can improve because most kids, I know that's a very blanket statement, but most of us when we're growing up, if you say, do you want to go to school? Kids go, no, I don't like school. I don't want to go to school, but they still improve because they know they have to be there. So my kind of, because I've got a child I'm working with at the moment and I'm still trying to figure out, this was kind of pre-lockdown. I'm trying to figure out, does he actually really want to be there? How do we find that? How do we mentally see that or within the traits of the physical traits of a child or the personality that they're putting across? Um, I mean, if we had time, I might want to get into a bit more of a philosophical question is about, you know, what do we mean by want to? And does, does it matter whether they want to in one sense? I mean, in a hedonistic um, way, of course it matters in a in a enjoy your life life's too short of course it matters in a as a coach i want to be teaching people who want to be there as a teacher i want to be teaching kids who want to be there i don't think i've ever come come across a classroom where every single one of them do want to be there so but i think your your, your point ben about even if you don't want to be there, you can still make progress. It's absolutely true. And we can point to a thousand examples of that. Um, I, I suppose the question I might be more interested in, because I, I was going to say kids aren't that self-aware often. A lot of adults aren't. You know, why do you do it? I don't know. Always have. <laughs> it's just something to do. <laughs> That's kind of what, that's, you know, I don't know. Um, but I would, one, I would go back to that research again and say, how about, think less about, do they really want to be there? And more about, how can I make it more likely that they want to be there? And, and that's back to that Pygmalion effect. You know, earlier, I, I don't know if you were with us at the time, Ben, I, I, I didn't see your video at that point, but I was talking about the Pygmalion and the Galatea effect. Maybe that Galatea effect is not there. Maybe they don't want to be there. Maybe they don't believe that they're going to do anything with it. Maybe they're just like, oh, I don't know, I just get taken here every week. But that doesn't mean to say we can't do the Pygmalion effect. If you keep at it and you keep helping them to succeed, and you get the balance right between challenge and success and support, you get that balance right, you know what, you're going to make it more likely that they do want to, to be there, you're going to make it more likely that they really want to be there, but difficult. I think that kind of pitches in, I was kind so of typing before, kind of 
Gavin asked the question, I wanted to kind of throw this in there from that kind of links in with with the mentality of this. And I think we should really be finding out and asking what the child wants from the session and what their own goals are. So say, for example, even if they don't know what a goal is, they'll still have an idea of what they want to get out of the session or what they want the ball to do. Because if you said, well, what are your goals? They're like, well, what's a goal? But they, they know in their head what they actually want to do. So then, therefore, if we can kind of find out what their belief is of success, because every child has a different belief or every person in life, doesn't matter if they're a child or 80 years old, everyone has a different belief of what that success is. So if we can help nurture more of that within each individual, if you were to look at an interview with um, Piers Morgan, and he was actually talking to uh, Jason Donovan once, and people always keep going on about how um, success is the key to happiness. But actually, if we were to flip that on its head, that the happiness is the key to success. So surely then if we were to measure where the child wants the ball to go or what they want from a session, then we can actually figure out, right, if that makes them happy, then surely that is going to make them more successful. So it drives them then further. Yeah. 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 It's so, it's so complex, isn't it? That it's back to the opening gambit, really, that this is a social science and it's so, so wildly different. You know, it, it, we, I'm sure all of us could write down 30 different reasons why kids turn up and compare them and we'd end up with a list of 300 different reasons why kids turn up. How do we know? And I suppose <clears throat> the key comes back to what's your job? Is your job to say, right, I'm going to coach whoever turns up and I'm going to do the best job I can in helping them to, and then dot, 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 what, what, how do you finish that sentence? Helping them to flourish, to grow, to improve, to be happy. And then I, I would ask you, well, what's the criteria for that? Okay. Because it could be they're just turning up because they fancy somebody else who's turned up. It could be that they've just been told to go there. It could be that uh, they've got nothing better to do. It could they're be, certainly you know. <laughs> there could be all sorts of push factors to get out. It could be that they want they desperately want to beat their mate. It could be all sorts of things, couldn't it? So it's it's how. Yeah, I suppose when it comes down to coaching, we're, 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 you're, you're talking coaching rather than psychology. We're not getting them to lie on the couch and tell me your inner secrets and do you really fancy your mother and so on. It's, it's, and why are you here and what are you doing? It's much more about, I'm a coach, I'm going to help them to make progress, but what does that progress look like? And if it is, as Darren was saying, I want them to be happy and that's it. And the parents ask, and I'm going to say, look, they've, they had a smile from ear to ear the whole time. And that's the criteria. Happy days. Brilliant. But if the criteria is something else, then be, know what that criteria is. So that yeah, you can talk about it with the kids, so that you can influence their thinking, you can influence the parents' thinking. And as we say, they've got to communicate with the kids more to know what they want out of it. To then pass Indeed. to communicate with the ch with the parents, but the first yeah. thing is but, wanting them to keep. But a lot of back. that, though, also is the language thing. I mean, picking up on Ben's point earlier as well, that they they sometimes can't articulate it; they don't know. But we can influence that. So I can go into a classroom and ask the kids what you're studying, and they say maths. Okay, <laughs> could you be a little bit more specific? Uh, really hard maths. Yeah. All right. And now you're getting on with it. Uh, all right, I suppose. And that's it, because they, they haven't been given the language. But then I can go into the very next classroom and say, what are you studying? Oh, uh, well, we're looking at angles on triangles at the minute. Oh, yeah. What's that all about then? Well, apparently, all the angles in a triangle add up to 180. And we're trying to work out which is which. And we're trying to work out if you've got one of the angles, how do you work out the other two angles? Oh, yeah. So how are you getting on? Well, I know what a right angle looks like, but I don't know what anything else looks like. So I'm trying to find that out right now. And that, they can be exactly the same age kids, but the second group's been given the language. 
right at the beginning. This is what we're studying. We're going to look at triangles. We're going to look at the angles of triangles. All those angles will add up to 180. This is what is right. And so we give it right at the beginning so that the, when the kids are asked, what are you learning? They can tell you. How much progress are you making? They can tell you. But the other classroom, they haven't been told that. So they just say, oh, I don't know, doing maths. So you go into the bay, what are you doing? I'm playing golf. Oh, yeah. How are you getting on? All right. OK, what are you going to do next? Try harder. Or they can say, well, I'm working on my backswing at the minute. Oh, yeah, why? Because, and then they give you some reasons. And how much progress have you made? Well, I managed to do that one, but I, I think I keep turning my wrist at the wrong time. So I'm trying my best to think about what I do with my wrist as I strike the ball. Mm. Do you see what I mean? That you, you, can, you can give them that language when you set it up at the beginning, but be clear about what that language is. Be clear about mm. your criteria. Because if you don't know what you're aiming for, the three feedback questions, number one is, what am I trying to achieve? Number two, how much progress have I made? Number three, what am I going to do next? That's it. That's feedback in a nutshell. But the problem is, if question one, they say, I don't know. What are you trying to do? I don't know. Play golf. Then if they don't know number one, they can't answer number two or number three. And then they won't know whether they're making progress or not. And if you set up that language at the beginning, you can say that to the kids, but you can also report that back to the parents. Brilliant. I think we've got we, we can obviously go on this topic for, for hours. Um, I just wanted to throw in there that I think that the culture that you create as a coach and the environment that you coach in is wholly appropriate when you're talking about this topic um, because that will bring in things like communication uh, and the understanding and, and how to give appropriate feedback and you know what's expected of the kids when they walk into your environment they sh that culture should be prevalent and they should feel it and, and kind of see it and you know even if you've got things up on the wall to help remind them of what uh, of what you stand for what that that environment stands for I think it's um I think that's an important consideration we do we do cover that obviously when we go through different topics in the certification I'm conscious of time James and I and I wanted to finish off with with the uh last topic which probably should have had the most airtime, um <clears throat> which is just uh, if you can give us a, a few nuggets of how we create, uh, how kids learn, how we create better learners, um, as opposed to us becoming better teachers or better deliverers of technical information. I think, um, I think I'd like to know a little bit more about how kids learn. Yeah, um, well, actually, I think we've covered uh, uh, much of what we have covered addresses that question um, Gavin, that number one, it's super complex, so we can't say for sure. Uh, number two is we can look at research and have a sense of what will probably help, but we can't say for sure. Third thing is motivation is very, very, very important. Of course it is. And we've talked about the relationship between success, motivation and challenge. Um, the, another one would be um, that sense of where am I going, how am I going, and what am I going to do next? That's those feedback questions, because if we are talking about coaching, then my sense is coaching involves making progress. If we are talking about playing, playing any, anything, any sport, any game, then it doesn't necessarily involve progress. It involves participation. It involves enjoyment. It involves teamwork, all sorts of things. But my sense is coaching involves progress. 
So that's why and I'm, I know it sounds as if I'm banging the same old drum here, but I would be thinking again and again, what is the progress that we're making? We don't have to measure it. We just have to have a sense of it. It can be subjective. It doesn't have to be objective. But it can't even be subjective if we haven't identified, first of all, what is it that success looks like? What are we aiming to do? And if that success is hit the ball harder, great. If it is enjoy it, great. If it is be the best teammate or the best listener or the best behaved, or reduce your handicap, or uh, put the most effort in, or wear a smile from ear to ear. Great. So long as we've got a sense of what is it we're aiming to do, then we can start to answer those next two parts. So how much progress are we making? And what could we do next to improve? Um, learning involves so many things, the mindset, and that overlaps. Then there's that being out of your comfort zone, which is what I talk about, the learning bit, what Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development. I mean, there's so many parts of learning, um, but I would come, I think that we've covered the, the most important relationships, and that is success leads to motivation. Motivation leads to success. You gotta get the challenge right in that. And to know that you are growing and learning and improving and making progress, you've got to have a sense of what's the criteria. In what fantastic. are we growing? I think that's a, a, a fantastic conclusion, really. And, and I think this is just the, the beginning of where we're going with this. Um, obviously, uh, there's more to learn and more to dive into. And uh, it is certainly hoped that over the next few weeks and months will bring you a whole host of new information and research but i tell you what would be interesting here is if you went back into the mighty networks chat room under this event and just gave some of your feedback that we can all share in um, some of you have not said anything which is cool but be great to hear what your thoughts are and to continue the discussion on the mighty networks platform so um yeah, James, it's been fascinating to have you on Under the Hat. Roger wants brownie points because he's got your book, but that looks like it was the first edition. Oh, though, oh there you go. Good man. <laughs> I'll sign it. I, will, I, I don't know what you're saying, but uh, there you go. I'll sign it for you. Don't get him speaking. We won't get off the phone. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's normally the closer um, of the show, Hello. but we love Roger. This is the new version, and it's available from all good bookshops named Amazon. Um, <laughs> so well worth kind of diving into. But James, listen, uh, on behalf of everybody, um, uh, and me, of course, thank you for joining us on Under the Hat. It's been fascinating and a great introduction to this conversation that I know will evolve, um, and we'll all dive deeper to into the uh, next few weeks and months. So thanks very much.